Dr. Allison, the mic is yours. Thank you very much, Elena, and thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the DEI Critical Conversation Flash Panel on the Ukraine Crisis. My name is Allison Davis White Eyes. I will be serving as the host and moderator for today's panel discussion on the crisis in Eastern Europe. DEI Critical Conversation Flash Panels are designed to address emergent issues nationally and globally. The panels are led by experts, both internal and external to the fielding community. The idea of the flash panel is to address and discuss difficult topics with goodwill. We believe that a democracy can only thrive when there is dialogue rooted in an ethic of care and that each of us has a moral responsibility to not look away when acts of violence against anyone in our global community occur. To that end, we ask that participants of today's panel and the audience please maintain an ethic of care in your questions and please place them into the chat function. We will try to address as many questions as we can in the time allotted. I also would like to emphasize that the flash panels are rooted in the LACE framework, LACE framework, developed by Dr. Yvette Alex Asenso of the University of Oregon. The acronym LACE stands for love, authenticity, courage, and empathy. And this is how all of our DEI critical conversations will be framed. We ask that you join in this spirit. As many of you are aware, we are witnessing an unprecedented situation unfold in Eastern Europe, a region that has a complicated history, both past and present, a region marked by the mass migrations of many different ethnic groups, ethnic cleansing, and the contestation of identity, sovereignty, and land. As we discuss the invasion and displacement of sovereign people, it is important to remind ourselves of our own history of dispossession in the United States. Let us remind ourselves that the home of Fielding Graduate University is located on the indigenous lands of the Chumash people in what is now Santa Barbara County and the lands of the Pamunkey, Nakotchtonk, and Piscataway people in our Washington DC office. Land, displacement, sovereignty, and identity all are a part of this larger global conversation. The situation in Ukraine is not so much a Euro European crisis as much as it is a global humanitarian crisis. It calls into question many different issues. In what way are nations, identities, and sovereignty created, imagined, and forcibly erased? As we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, how is the invasion of Ukraine and narratives of difference affecting minoritized groups within Ukraine, such as Nigerian and Asian international students, Jewish communities, women, people with disabilities? How has anti-LGBTQ rhetoric been amplified during this crisis? For what purpose and to what ends? What are the tropes and narratives that are being developed and disseminated through social media? And what are the effects of these tropes and narratives on notions of an inclusive democracy? And also, what are the effects of these tropes and narratives and memes on our own mental health and well being? What are the implications of this invasion? And most importantly, what can we do as individuals? These questions and more will be answered and addressed in today's panel, but at this time, please allow me to take time to thank each of our panelists and to introduce them. <clears throat> I'll start with Dr. Rich Applebaum, who serves as doctoral faculty and director of leadership for sustainability in the School of Leadership Studies. Dr. Applebaum has published extensively in social theory, urban sociology, public policy, the globalization of business, and the sociology of work and labor. Dr. Philip Knice is a faculty member from Oregon State University in the School of Public Policy with a focus on political theory. He holds an MA from Humboldt University, Berlin, Germany, and a PhD from Potsdam University in Germany. His research interests pertain to the intersections of culture and politics in the US and the European Union. Dr. Leslie Ann Pittard is joining us as Assistant Vice President for Campus and Community Engagement and Affiliate Faculty within the division, uh, within the Clark Honors College at the University of Oregon. 
She was also the former chief liaison for external and strategic partnerships in the Equity and Inclusion Laboratory at the University of Wisconsin. Dr. Pichard brings a broad global perspective to DEI. She holds a doctorate from the University of Virginia and is a graduate of Hampton University and HBCU. We are also joined by Dr. Pamela Rutledge, doctoral faculty in media psychology here at Fielding. Dr. Rutledge applies behavioral, social, and neuroscience to understand the impact of media content and technology design and the anticipation of audience behaviors. She also focuses on identifying human motivations, behavioral triggers, and instinctive drives to inform messaging and data strategies that deliver actionable insights. And we have Dr. Regina Tuma. She serves as doctoral faculty here in Fielding in Media Psychology. Dr. Tuma is a social psychologist who is very much interested in perception, cognition, gestalt theory, and the history of psychology as a source of innovation for media psychology. So let us begin by providing some context for our conversation today. And we're going to start with Dr. Kanais. What exactly is the current situation and how did we get here? Who are the key players in this region? Dr. Kanais. Thank you very much. Let me, in true well, historian and political theory person fashion, throw up some map maps. What we are facing here is um, has long historical roots. I myself was born in East Germany, so I grew up under Soviet rule. I'm very familiar with some of the ways of thinking applied here. When we look at how the Russian Empire expanded into parts of Asia and Europe, um, you see how you have a vast geographical space um, that's, that has developed over many years. But we also need to see this in context um, um, of um, the German and Austro-Hungarian empires which also claimed these spaces. From both an Imperial Russian Soviet and but also a German Austrian perspective, whatever territory you find between Germany and Russia has been historically contested. Uh, Timothy Snyder even refers to them as bloodlands. And you've had a very brutal history of dispossession, of redrawing of borders, of conquests, and um, overall imperial ambitions. Uh, you see that in, on this map, even Co um, Poland has disappeared and uh, Romania is um, just a small part. And what, um, what the territory of Ukraine, um, Belarus and Poland is overall in the Baltic States has been subsumed into, into the Russian empire over many centuries. In 1939, between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, there was the Hitler-Stalin Pact or Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, which guaranteed non-aggression. It also prepared the German attack on Poland in 1939 and the Soviet attack on the rest of Poland uh, just about two weeks later. Uh, the Soviet Union also conquered the Baltic states, parts of Finland and Bessarabia, which is um, Moldova. And so between this very unhappy cooperation, again, these borderlands were conquered by these two empires. Of course, we all know that Nazi Germany did not respect uh, the non-aggression pact eventually and uh, attacked the Soviet Union in 1941 and expanded into Ukrainian, Belarusian, Baltic and Russian territory. A lot of the fighting took place in Ukraine. Ukraine was caught between brief independence, then being conquered by the Soviet Union, being starved almost to death under Stalin in the so-called Holodomor, and then between the promise that maybe Nazi Germany could provide some form of emancipation, which of course failed. Some of the accusations of Ukraine being beholden to Nazism come from this brief fight for continued independence under which some Ukrainian nationalists thought Nazi Germany would provide the solution to their problem. It didn't. 
From this time also here the horrible crimes against the Jewish population in this area. The site of Babi Yar, which was recently attacked by Russia, um, is a memorial to the shooting of thousands of innocent Jewish civilians and dropping them into the ravine at Babi Yar. And so there's a long history of war, of genocide, of forced starvation already affecting this area. When the Soviet Union constituted itself, it consisted of several so-called Soviet socialist republics. Socialism, of course, in parlance outside of the United States, refers to a philosophy that it aims to uh, achieve communism eventually. So, so when we say socialism here, it basically means what we in the United States would call communism. Now, the Russian Socialist um, Federal Soviet Republic was the biggest of those, but we see also that Ukraine is an um, own Socialist Soviet Republic, so is Georgia, so on um, the Baltic states. But they are still situated within the larger framework of the Soviet Union. The so-called Iron Curtain, which descended um, through Europe and the world in 1945, um, separated um, Germany, but it also separated much of uh, Central and Eastern Europe from the other parts of Central and Western Europe. Yugoslavia is an exception. It kind of remained neutral between both blocs while being still communist. Albania sided with China. There's also a long antagonism between Russia and China. And there are even territorial claims still between Russia and China, especially when it comes to auto Manchuria. When we see this map of the Iron Curtain, it explains um, why a lot of these countries that were held under the Soviet umbrella wanted to seek not just independence, but also protection under NATO. NATO has not really been an issue and NATO expansion happened in a way that NATO never to this point held any military power close to Russia that could be of any danger to Russia. Let's also not forget that the Kaliningrad Grad exclave former Königsberg um, belonging to Russia holds significant military potential too. So that like, NATO is, has not been a threat to Russia uh, and whatever threat it could pose could be easily countered by Russia. So whenever Putin says NATO is the problem, it probably is a smokescreen. Part of German policy during the Cold War was to try to achieve some kind of change in their relationship with Russia or the Soviet Union through trade or wandel durch annäherung, change through rapprochement. And part of that policy also was to continue relying on gas and oil from Russia, which actually has a long history. And uh, we know that the Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2 pipelines were also built in that spirit. Um, they were built also to avoid transferring oil and gas, or especially gas, through Ukraine. And so there have been pipelines built um, to circumvent Ukraine for a while. And we also know that Russia uh, waged a war against Georgia in 2008. I must say that the claim that Georgia held to three of their autonomous republics could be indeed um, challenged. Um, and there might have been an argument to say South Ossetia and North Ossetia should unify. And Ajar and Abkhazia should probably not belong to Georgia because there were autonomous Soviet socialist republics within Georgia. But be that as it may, it probably did not justify the war that Russia led against Georgia. So this is something that should have been solved with diplomacy. Similarly, whatever the situation of um, alleged um, problems against the Russian minority in the Donbas area were, could have been solved diplomatically, certainly. We know that Vol Volodymyr Zelensky, when he was voted into office, um, plat uh, had a platform wanting to see a rapprochement with Russia, but it um, um, apparently was ignored. We also know that Transnistria, just between Moldova and Ukraine, is a kind of um, separatist region also where you have a form of government that mimics the Soviet Union still in existence. All of these areas prevented NATO accession to um, by Ukraine, Moldova and NATO. 
Ukraine also was not necessarily ready for NATO membership or not for EU membership. So this would have been, in any case, any discussion of NATO or EU membership would have been a matter of probably decades. Shortly before the war, this map appeared uh, on a Russian talk show. I, this is a screenshot from a German talk show that showed it. And it shows the formation of the borders of Ukraine. And it shows different, different gifts, Podarki. Uh, so in the north, you see in orange, um, Podarki was Kirsare, um, gifts by the Russian Tsar. In orange to the right, you see Podarki Vladimir Ilyich Lenina, gifts by Lenin. Red, the gift by Khrushchev, Crimea. And to the left, um, gifts by Joseph Stalin. And you see in yellow, in the middle, a very thin area, slim area, Ukraine. This map is based on what Putin said about what constitutes Ukraine. And this is probably the assumption we are operating on under right now. Yeah. So I'm going to stop right here. I can talk a little bit further down the line about um, what Europe has been done as direction. I'm sure all of us have followed the news, but let's move on to maybe our next panelist. Oh, thank you, uh, Dr. Knais, uh, for that overview of a very complicated uh, and complex subject. As we think about the key issues presented here, we cannot help but wonder about the global situation such as it is from a broader social science perspective. Uh, Dr. Applebaum, building on the context in the previous presentation, what perspective would you like to share related to the Ukraine crisis, particularly from a social science perspective? You're on mute. Am I good? Yes. So thank you, Allison, uh, for setting this up and for the question. It's a sort of a thankless job to take a 40,000 foot elevation view of the tragedy that we see in front of us. And on a personal note, I also have to say, uh, uh, based on the previous presentation, that my own ancestors come from these disputed shifting territories and fled at the end of the 19th century, fled the pogroms that were here, um, which sort of brings it home to me. Uh, but let me give a try and talk about globalization. So when I was in graduate school um, many, many years ago, um, geopolitics was the name of the game. The Cold War between the US and the USSR. China at the time was not a player. In fact, uh, shortly after the Chinese Revolution, Mao met to meet with Stalin hat in hand, basically to ask for help. Something to think about now that Putin has gone to uh, Xi Jinping hat in hand to ask for help. It shows a reversal of fortunes of these two states, these two empires. So um, geopolitics, you know, is where nations or empires um, use geography to heighten their own interests and advance their own interests. And um, it was supposed to end with the war end of World War II. After a century marked by depression and two world wars at Bretton Woods, an open world economy was envisioned where um, products and you know, everything, commerce would flow across borders. Borders would come down, something that was realized in 1995 with the creation of the World Trade Organization. And I also want to emphasize that the real spurt for globalization, that is say the erasure of national borders as economic barriers, uh, began in 1971. Not coincidentally, this is when Intel marketed the first commercial microchip. For those who don't remember, it was the Intel 4004, a four-bit CPU that sold for $60 and it made possible for businesses to operate globally and extremely efficiently uh, cheaply and so forth, accessing labor, raw materials and markets. Um, globalization, at least in my view, had a number of effects that I'm gonna just tick them off quickly. This is sort of the Cliff Notes version of this. Um, one is it eroded the power of states to manage their own economic affairs. Since the control of, uh, since workers, for example, to gain workers' rights require a rule of law which exists in the world today only within national borders. So really is no international enforceable legal mechanisms. Globalization also gave rise to what Fareed Zakaria popularizes the rise of the rest, um, which began to challenge 
the hegemony of the United States and to a lesser degree Europe and Japan. Um, we have to point out, of course, that not all the rest have risen and nobody have risen equally. Um, that leads to the next point, globalization resulted in just enormous global inequality, both within the core states, what when I was a graduate student, we called undeveloped economies, um, um, but also within, um, you know, between economies uh, throughout the world. And globalization also, we don't have time to consider this, contributed enormously to global warming uh, because it really accelerated the pace of economic development in many places, including especially in China. So that brings me to nationalism. And I'll just briefly say a couple of things here. I think all these forces fueled the rise of nationalism. Uh, this both within the artificially constructed Western constructed boundaries of states which had been former colonies uh, artificially constructed, um, but also within multi-ethnic states like the United States. My own history reminds me that there's nothing like being left behind in a world where a handful of super rich people have more wealth than everybody else to fuel the rise of nativism and pointing the finger at the other as the source of all problems whether the others are Jews or Latino immigrants in the United States or alleged Nazis uh, um, in Ukraine, according to Putin. Um, so I would just say from Germany in the 1930s to January 6th, um, this is a common thread, um, this kind of uh, other marginalization that fosters anti-other violence. So in 1992, right after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, Francis Fukuyama famously predicted that we'd reach the end of history and geopolitics with the triumph of Western liberal democracy. Not so fast. It turns out geopolitics is here on steroids. And a big part of my research has focused on the rise of China. I don't have time to work, talk about that. But I will say this, China is changing the rules of the game and the global economy. Um, from the uh, market liberalism, market fundamentalism, neoliberalism to state managed capitalism. And um, many countries are jumping on and also uh, to the nationalism uh, that is, uh, Xi Jinping has launched. So let me now very briefly turn to Russia and Ukraine. Um, Dr. Kanis did an excellent job. So I just wanna make highlight two possible explanations that he mentioned. One, and there's a great essay by Chris Hedges on this, basically blames NATO. And, you know, it points out that, you know, NATO's expansion to incorporate uh, the countries that have formerly been part of the Soviet Union um, brought nuclear weapons to within 100 miles of Russia's borders. Uh, we can remind ourselves that when the Soviet Union did that in Cuba, we risked the nuclear war to stop it. And, um, to me, that does make some sense. George Kennan famously said that the expansion of NATO at the time was the most fateful era of American policy after the Cold War and predicted it would lead Russia in exactly this direction. The other explanation is the one that Dr. Kinesis advanced and which Fiona Hill had an excellent essay on recently, um, which basically it's um, Putin's efforts to redraw the boundaries and redefine history uh, to celebrate the old Russian empire, um, to reimagine it. And um, the fear that uh, Ukraine will not just fall under NATO security umbrella, but that it'll be westernized and Europeanized and uh, taken forever out of uh, the embrace of Russian nationalism. So I, of course, aren't gonna offer a solution here. Uh, it's beyond my pay grade certainly, but um, you know, I do think that one thing that Zelensky has um, offered is to give up NATO aspirations and that may provide a path forward, at least it would call Putin's bluff on that. Let me conclude with three long range solutions and these will be very brief. One, I think this war reveals the, the folly of dependence on global supply chains. Um, we now know that much of the world's wheat, corn and barley come from Russia and Ukraine. Prices for food, fertilizer, oil, gas, even aluminum, nickel, palladium are rising fast. 
So there's a lesson about the about globalization here, and that is uh, we should try to move away from the global model and be much more local. Second lesson, uh, we have to end our global economic dependence on fossil fuel. Um, the fact that you know Europe can't really cut its ties um, with Russia in terms of gas supplies without totally tanking the world economy shows us how dependent we are and how vulnerable we are uh, for this. So, you know, apart from the environmental aspects of, um, um, of carbon-based economy, I think supply chain is another one. And finally, I know I'm over time, we have to get rid of nuclear weapons. We haven't talked about that, but um, that is in the shadow here and hopefully remains in the shadow. And maybe this will make us move faster on the, that account. So I'll finish there and later I can give some suggestions of places to look on these issues. Thank you, Dr. Applebaum. Uh, thank you for that very insightful commentary on the state of the situation such as it is. Um, I think your presentation raises a lot of questions about uh, how we communicate right, uh, about this war, some of the narratives that are being created. You gave us some examples of things that are happening, but I guess a, qu a larger question is, so how is that communicated to people and how are they consuming this, this information, if you will? Um, so at this point, I would like to turn to Dr. Tuma to share her commentary on communication with a particular emphasis on the unique use and role of social media in the coverage of Ukraine? How is it influencing democracy and political discourse in the United States? Thank you, Allison. Thank you, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, so yes, I will be talking about, uh, or just offering some sort of bullet points uh, to think about um, uh, sort of media coverage and in particular social media, uh, what we're seeing on social media and its effects on political discourse in the United States. So I am somewhat here to rehabilitate uh, social media and to set it free from uh, the last four years, right? So what we've seen on social media uh, since 2016. What we are now seeing um, are individuals in Ukraine using these various platforms to tell their stories. Reporters, experts are bringing their expertise. Ukrainian citizens are chronicling uh, their experiences. Even in Russia, where platforms, social media have been banned, uh, they still turn to Telegram as a platform, but they've been very, um, you know, um, uh, we see their ingenuity in trying to escape these bans. And so they're actually getting out images of protest and dissent that we are seeing. And it's very powerful to see Russians who are risking their lives, right? Uh, who disagree with the war. You saw last week, um, the Russian journalist who actually not only, uh, she actually posted a video talking about uh, how she felt about the war and then actually went on state TV uh, holding up a sign. Uh, but, we, but it's not just Russians. We're seeing all these compelling stories from uh, Ukrainians as well. The reason why I want to rehabilitate of sorts uh, social media is because in this sense, right, what we're seeing here is a reclaiming of social media platforms uh, that go back to the revolutionary early period of social media uh, and the images that we saw, namely from about 2009 to 2011, with starting with the Green Revolution in Iran, Arab Spring, the Indignados in Spain, the Tent Movement in Israel, and our own Occupy, and also the protests that were going on in Russia um, at the time um, uh, against Putin and some of the changes going on to the constitution, his reelection uh, and, and to media. So, and what we also see, we also think of social media as flat spaces, right? But we do see some nuances emerging uh, in terms of the coverage. And here I'd like to mention how uh, there was a subtext emerging, a sub, 
uh, narrative, uh, picking up on sort of the racial angle to uh, the refugee crisis. And so we saw that students and families of color um, were experiencing racism in reaching borders in Poland and Hungary. Uh, and then this was aired on social media, but it was also picked up uh, immediately by networks and it made a difference uh, as media coverage followed up on the situation in terms of the border policies and their ability uh, to get out. So the information and use of social media now differs from what we have seen since 2016, where we saw this ugly side um, uh, to social media as spaces of conspiracies, fake news, informational and algorithmic rabbit holes, right? Political trolling and extreme political and, and psychological polarization. Um, I'd like to, it's important here, I wanna emphasize this, to keep in mind that the same structural platforms of the medium, right? Of, of social media can be used for constructive and destructive purposes. Social media can unite us in seeing um, political reality in a country far away, or social media can blind us and turn us against each other as we have seen since 2016. Now, I also wanna caution me in particular, myself, right? Uh, and us, that this reversal of social media, of the social media gestalt that we have been seeing uh, is not an absolute reversal to when social media were cheered on solely as instruments of democracy. Uh, there are lots of conspiracy theories out there and they continue. There is the neo-Nazi theme and in particular, the one that the uptick recently in the biolab conspiracy and the, the, the fact that the US uh, has uh, bioweapon labs in Ukraine. So we are uh, seeing an up, uptick in that. And the researcher, Kate Starbird, who actually studies online rumors, has actually looked at what she, she calls this participatory disinformation where what you see are elites or government actors setting the frame or seed narrative for misinformation and conspiracies. And then users and influencers, audiences, right, do the work to assemble the evidence after the fact, after the seed narrative has been put out there, right? So they do the work to fit the frame of the talking points, providing a fill in the blanks approach to confirmation bias. Indeed, after a slow start to uh, what we were seeing in terms of the media ecosystem and in particular on social media, we are now seeing uh, Russian talking points getting across the entire uh, media ecosystem from social media network, from social media to networks like Fox, and in particular here, I'm talking about Tucker Carlson, who is actually, his show is being played on state or being referred to uh, on uh, state Russian TV. And it is billed as uh, showing that in the United States, there is actually support for the Russian position. And we also see this not just by far right fringe elements, but we're also seeing some of these talking points uh, emerge um, in terms of uh, the far left, right? And here I point to Glenn Greenwald, uh, who also appears on uh, Fox News these days and is also talking about the biolab uh, conspiracies. So I'd like to turn now to sort of what all of this is doing to us uh, and our attitudes um, and the effects of all of this on the internal political attitudes in the United States. So what we know is that all eyes are on Ukraine. The war in Ukraine has created what Diane and Katz called a media event, right? Media events transfix the audience. Um, and as these are televised on TV and in the media ecosystem, audiences kind of react to these events uh, as an invitation and in fact, Diane and Kat say they are a command to join in on the experience and to see it. So Americans, 
yes, we can use the term Americans broadly here, right, uh, are paying attention. And so here's what we know. Americans across the political spectrum support the Ukraine and Americans in both parties support the sanctions and aid to Ukraine, even if they need to pay more gas, uh, more for gas and energy, right? Um, the idea of NATO, uh, which post 2016 was really attacked has been reinvigorated despite the rhetoric of undermining, um, undermining it or even um, in terms of support for leaving NATO. So now the attitudes towards NATO are starting to change and there is support. Republicans in Congress, which had supported Trump policies undermining Ukraine are now voting in favor of aid and very publicly going against the former president who um, continues to, you know, sometimes backtrack, but sometimes showing, uh, you know, talking about Ukraine. So what we're seeing is Republicans in, in Congress uh, going against that. So the question for me as a social psychologist uh, is the question of is this or will there be a kind of recalibration of attitudes and what will the effects be in terms of our own internal policies? I think what we are seeing on social media and news networks is a focus on a country that is fighting in the name of democracy and freedom. I stress the word freedom, because if you have been in the United States over the past, since 2016, right, we have seen and heard the word freedom a lot, as it has been used uh, in the name of anti-science and conspiracies, mask wearing, all of the things. I call it, it's a notion of freedom, let me just say, um, that is based on individual rights or what I call a kind of consumer a la carte understanding of individual freedom that is based on, I don't want to do this, but I want this and I don't want this and I certainly don't want this, right? What is on display in Ukraine is different. We are seeing in Ukraine an existential fight for freedom and democracy. It's collective sacrifice that involves a collectivity, individuals united, no matter what their views, for what seems to be a very noble cause. Our social media and information ecosystem have been turned into mini morality plays right in the palm of our hands, right, when we look at social media. And these morality plays highlight the conflict between good and evil, between right and wrong, the lives of ordinary Ukrainian individuals are intertwined now with higher values of courage, sacrifice, and humanity. But this fight for democracy, for freedom, is not based on an individual rights premise, as has been the case here in the United States. Um, in the process, I'll just say quickly as I'm running out of time here, there has also, as all of this has played out, in the broader media ecosystem, there is implicit learning going on, right? Um, and there's a possibility that this will reset somewhat our politics in the United States. You know, look, when you look at Ukraine, all of a sudden these freedom convoys against vaccines take on a different hue and might even seem petty and small, okay? In retrospect, we are learning about the history of Ukraine its role within NATO, and what the heck is the European Union? We are learning about authoritarianism. All of this has the potential to recalibrate how we perceive previous events. And here I'm talking about Trump's first impeachment, which had to do all of with, you know, with Ukraine, right? And a phone call to Zelensky who needed military aid. So, um, the flirtation and support for Putin that we have seen on the right in this country and abroad, right? I mean, Salvini in Italy is in trouble for his support of Putin. And there are others in France as well, in Hungary. Um, we are seeing US support for Putin and those politicians who supported Putin is now beginning to seem suspect. 
right? Um, even Fox News has had to change uh, its coverage to the war um, and uh, retreat somewhat uh, with the exception of Tucker Carlson. So I'm just gonna conclude here by emphasizing the word possibility of changing attitudes. And I'm, I'll be a Freudian here and be cautious and remind myself that return of the repressed is real and can easily come back. Midterm elections are coming. Buttons will be pressed about Trump keeping Putin in line and Biden being a weak leader. And it is important not to commit the same mistake. You know, Rich talked about Francis Fukuyama, the end of history. Well, I'm gonna say that in 2008, after the election of Barack Obama, we were too quick, psychologists included, to proclaim the post-racial society, that we were post-race because we had elected Barack Obama. And that never came to fruition. So as a social psych psychologist, I'm always looking for that seemingly elusive moment of attitude change. We are governed by habits and rituals. But I keep in mind Hannah Arendt's remark that thinking doesn't always appear, but when it does, we can see and we'll see its effects. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tuma. And that's a great quote to end on. Uh, and I'd like to take that quote and kind of tie it in uh, with our next presenter, Dr. Rutledge, because we're talking about uh, consuming a variety of messages through social media, but we also need to talk about how we manufacture some of these messages. And we've seen a lot of manufacturing of doom and gloom. So <laughs> we'd like to hear from you. Okay, well, after all the complexity, I'm gonna take us, I'm gonna take us right down uh, to something simple. And I wanna talk about the role of means and media in communicating, taking something very complicated and trying to make it simple to disseminate to the public and how important that is in crafting the narratives that Regina referred to around crisis and influencing who we see as the hero and the villain, and as Rich said, who we see as the other. So social media memes seem like a pretty harmless concept, right? We've all seen celebrities paired with irreverent humorous commentary, uh, at cats with attitude and misspelled uh, captions, I has cheeseburger, Gene Wilder from Willy Wonka. But social media aesthetics are now shaping the way we're seeing the war. They aren't, people aren't seeing those fabulous maps they're seeing memes that are framing how they interpret all of this information. More information is flowing through social media than traditional sources. More information is flowing than ever before through non-elite sources, man on the street, soldiers in the field, and even the reporters are live streaming to Facebook and Instagram. TikTok influencers are getting White House briefings on the UK, Ukraine invasion because the White House is recognizing how many people they're actually connecting with and explaining or not explaining these global events. So the days when people could self-isolate from politics are long gone. And I think, you know, to that point, I think Regina, you're absolutely right that there is the potential for change here just because there is such an increase in awareness. Short form content and these memes are defining the narrative of this war, particularly for younger generations. Now, as, as you all know, meme is not a new concept. It was coined in 1976 by British evolutionary biologist, Richard Dawkins. His version of the meme though, is not the way we're thinking of it now. He was defining it as a cultural piece of information that like DNA can travel, mutate and evolve, but it was based upon his understanding of evolution. So they were not as it is now where internet memes are deliberate attempts to copy something and reconstruct it to the meaning of the creator. So modern memes, if you said, what's a meme, you would think instantly think of some, one of these images with a funny joke caption that encapsulates feelings of a specific audience or a specific culture and connects people by spreading across social media. These memes are much more persuasive than most people realize. They are engaging, they are efficient forms of messaging, they trigger emotion and identity, most often through humor. As we know, you learn more when you're 
emotionally activated. And they also activate existing mental models, stereotypes, and beliefs that anchor our meaning. So they succeed in translating complicated concepts by drawing on the things that we already know and believe to construct a new narrative frame for understanding human experience and these various global phenomena. Memes have been used in the culture wars for more than a decade to further political agendas and social issues, but they're being used in a real war now. So they've taken on a whole new uh, intensity and um, in import because they are removing language barriers. They're providing multiple points of entry and into bridging platforms across digital generations. Uh, the power of the meme has taken full flight on TikTok. Whereas Arab Spring was the first Twitter war, the Ukraine invasion is the first TikTok war. The interesting thing about this is the Ukraine has actually quite a lot of influencers that are very successful in their fashion influencers and travel influencers. These people with half a million followers are now showing what it's like on the streets, showing missiles in the sky, showing their apartment buildings being blown up or the windows blown out in their bomb shelter. And they're bringing this sort of man on the street experience to a generation. TikTok has over a billion monthly users, right? This is, but they're heavily skewed to Gen Z. The other thing that's been so influential is that Ukrainian President Zelensky has actually appealed to TikTok users to help him end the war. Now, Zelensky himself is a master of social media. He has done a wonderful job in communicating himself as a person and creating himself not as some political figure, but as a human being fighting for his country. And so I want to reiterate what Regina said, which is really that this has become a very personal event because of social media. In fact, there are uh, there's a phenomenon called fan cams, which is where people take bits of media, they edit it to create another version of that media to promote a point of view. So there is, there's a whole growing micro genre of Zelensky edits that shows Zelensky as a hero, often in the face of the cold and ruthless Putin. So let me just say, why are social media memes so powerful in political campaigns? One, they're easy to consume. Social media is short, snackable content. It's humanizing. It humanizes an experience. People talk right into the camera. They're in a real area. And social media has not only shown us what it's like on the street, they've made Zelensky feel real to the point where people are developing parasocial relationships with him, the sense that they know him and they're emotionally invested in. It's also normalizing. The tragedy of war is overwhelming. Social media allows citizens to engage and actually process events. They can share their stress and perspectives on a global stage. They can get feedback and validation. It's a very normal response to these terrible things. And humor, in fact, is a very powerful coping mechanism for dealing with horrible events. Social media is real. It is real time. Live streaming, you are there. And as any marketer will tell you, people believe word of mouth advertising 90% to 10 over what information they get from other sources. Social media through influencers, through man on the streets is word of mouth advertising. The fact that there's so much sharing just further seeks to validate and spread these information. And as we also know, the more you hear something, the more believable it becomes, right? It starts to create an anchor to fill in that and create that cognitive bias. The fact that it's been so effective is really evidenced by the fact that Putin has totally shut down all access to social media and uh, various alternative news sources. So on the positive side, Memes are serving an important function. They're providing a voice and they're sharing a cultural narrative about the Ukrainian invasion. I would bet you most TikTok users had never figured out where the Ukraine was before. They know now and they know in a very personal way. On the negative side, this kind of emotive and emotional content can keep people from questioning the accuracy of a video. And as we know, there's been false information put out by um, people on both sides, although that was the sort of the 
sort of the go-to of the, the Russian uh, communication uh, for a while. But I think it's really important to remember that what we're seeing here is, is very unique in terms of the visceral impression of, um, of a conflict. And so even though there's a chance for misinformation, or problematic videos on TikTok, I would argue that what's happening here is largely positive. That the amount of information that's coming from so many voices and creates so many different conversations that will ultimately shape people's attitude and hopefully make them care in a way that will cause them to engage civically in a much different kind of way. Thank you very much, Dr. Rutledge. I think you brought up a lot of great points here, and we're hoping to tie all of these together in kind of concluding remarks around DEI, where we're headed with that. And if we think about narratives and memes, we've also seen a lot of images, and those are also very powerful. And we have seen images of minoritized people having struggles getting across borders. And so it raises a lot of questions about what is going on glo globally, and in particular in Eastern Europe, as regards diversity, equity, and inclusion. We've seen the rise of the anti-LGBTQ rhetoric, for instance, throughout this whole uh, crisis. So Dr. Petard, we'd like to pivot to you and, and hear your commentary on the intersections of global diversity. Um, perhaps looking at extremism and nationalistic rhetoric. Uh, and, and how do you see DEI moving beyond the American narrative of difference to be more global in its understanding? Good afternoon. Thank you, panelists, for your contributions, as I've appreciated what you each have shared. I echo the appreci appreciation, too, to you, Dr. Allison davis Whiteyes, for organizing this important flash panel and the opportunity to be here today in community to support and engage one another around this humanitarian crisis. <clears throat> for the next few minutes, I'd like to position DEI in a global context and share the intersection of global diversity, extremism, and nationalistic rhetoric in this humanitarian crisis. I'll start my comments the same way that I'll close them by framing them around a few stanzas from the opening and closing of The Hill We Climb by Amanda Gorman, shared during the inauguration of the 46th President of the United States of America. It begins, when day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never ending shade? The loss we carry, a sea we must wade. We've braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace and the norms and notions of what just is, isn't always justice. And yet the dawn is ours before we knew it. Somehow we do it. Somehow we've weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. Although Gorman's poem is centered in America, it is positioned within a global context. We understand that America is the youngest country in the world and has adopted the global practices of racism, extremism, misogyny, and nationalism, and made them as American as apple pie. These isms are deeply embedded into the soul of our nation as it is in our world. We see it blatantly in the U Ukraine humanitarian crisis, for which I'll highlight a few examples. The Russian state media has shared a barrage of propaganda, some of which is provided by our own American media talking heads, who I will not name, but were named before. This nationalistic rhetoric is being used to justify the need to ethnically cleanse Ukraine, rhetoric we have also seen before, and rhetoric that is indeed very dangerous. Ironically, this crisis did not start on February 24th, and as discussed in the great opening provided around this context, notes that it's been building. And in the last eight years, um, our own government has been involved, notably in the mo most recently with the 45th president of the United States, who helped set the stage for this invasion, as well as the tearing down of global community, seeking to weaken NATO and further divide us around issues of difference. This first social media war, an important distinction, as this is the first time we've seen anything like this play out on our own media outlets. We're watching this in real time. But what we haven't seen in real time are the several other humanitarian crises, which did not get the same coverage or attention. Some have, some have even commented that what makes this different is that they look like us. 
Those who look like me in Ukraine face racial bias and discrimination and not being able to evacuate as easily. We saw that in the African refugees, mind you scholars, um, not being able to board the train, facing prejudice, assaults and threats, causing them to fear for their own safety in additional ways to fleeing from the war. While we are watching this on our news, we are seeing um, what feels like the never ending global health pandemic continue and surge. COVID cases are on the rise in Germany, Netherlands, and Poland. We know that there will be significant and disproportionate impacts resulting from COVID. We also see gender um, as a critical intersection of the humanitarian crisis. As men are staying to fight for Ukraine, the women and children are fleeing with literally what they can carry in their hands. Ukrainian women and children are facing housing insecurity as there are limited placements in shelters and with community members. There are hosts of disparities around reproductive health, physical safety, um, and other issues facing vulnerable populations. I believe there's been one reported or known case of rape. We already know what the implications and statistics of rape are. There is a quiet and continued detainment of Brittany Griner, a black, gay, female, all-star American basketball player, signaling a key, a key global issue around intersectional identities. Her detainment remains relatively undiscussed and unresolved. So much to say here, but I will quickly note that Griner technically should not even be in Russia in the first place. Griner is an all-star WNBA player for the Phoenix Mercury, an example of pay equity amongst American female athletes versus male athletes who rarely, if ever, have to offset their income by playing abroad in the off season. I haven't even scratched the tip of the proverbial iceberg of all the other issues um, that we are clearly seeing play out, but noting that there is a role at intersection of diversity, extremism, and national rhetoric in this humanitarian crisis. It is obvious we need to widen our DEI lens um, and position diversity, equity, and inclusion beyond the American gaze and place it as a global narrative of difference. We need to continue to advance the global momentum from which the summer of 2020 brought around racial reckoning. We must continue our learning, support, and encouragement of international communities seeking justice and merge our truths towards a shared global agenda of action. How can we be actively anti-racist, especially as higher education practitioners sort of noting this crisis? We must not just talk about this, we must actively change and sort of recalibrate around our policies, behaviors, and beliefs that perpetuate racist ideas within and beyond the ivory tower. We must move from pontification to accountability, solutions, mobilization, community, and healing. There are critical implications for our most vulnerable populations, largely in higher ed protected through titles six, seven, and nine. Um, we must heighten our commitment to allyship and belonging to those who identify as LGBTQIA+. We need to disrupt toxic campus cultures and issues of school safety to ensure all members can truly belong and participate. And we must double down on our efforts to promote and sustain universal design, indeed ensuring that all members can access um, and bring their full selves and talents. Although we are indeed facing and, and embedded deeply in this global crisis, we see and know that we are the change. That's what keeps me going. I am inspired that in the midst of all this, literally right now, we are having a historic nomination and confirmation process for Judge Katanji Brown Jackson, the first ever black woman nominated to the US Supreme Court. Our journey onward continues, and that is indeed the hill we climb. We will rise from the sun-baked South. We will rebuild, reconcile, and recover. And every known nook of our nation and every corner called our country our people, diverse and beautiful, will emerge, battered and beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it, for there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. Thank you for this opportunity to be here in community with you this afternoon, and I'm looking forward to our forthcoming discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Pittard. And thank you for sharing that beautiful poem, very apropos 
And certainly you are correct. We are the change. That's why we're here today. Round of applause for all of our panelists. Amazing. And now we will open this up to your questions. Elena. Yes, thank you. And we have the first question from uh, Dr. Greg Williams. Dr. Applebaum, what would you suggest as a viable solution solutions to, to the globalization problems you describe? Perhaps a world system perspective? Hi. Uh, that's a great question from my former student, Greg Williams. Sort of one out of spec from you, Greg. Um, I can't give a, a complete answer that I would just say this. I think we need to relocalize. Walden Bello, who is a Filipino sociologist, um, has written a number of books on deglobalization. And the idea is that we should shorten our global supply chains as much as we can. Some things we can't, but um, you know, we should move away from a border of this world. And the other thing, I mean, there's a whole series of things. I'll just say one other thing. Uh, a problem that I raise is there is no international rule of law. Uh, legal frameworks are national frameworks. The UN has no enforcement power. Um, the only international rule is through military force, uh, which is not the same as the rule of law. So um, at least as long as we don't have everybody speaking Esperanto and borders disappearing and kumbaya for everybody, um, trade agreements need to contain protections for the environment and uh, for workers. Um, so I would, that's the direction I would go, but that's all I'll say about that right now. If, if anyone is interested, I'll be teaching a course in global systems uh, shortly and we'll be covering all these topics. Thank you. Next question is from Dr. Christine Jacquin. Uh, Dr. Tuma and Dr. Radlich, do you believe individuals can be helpful in this situation through social media? If so, what do you suggest? Uh, let me give you an example of something that is already happening. Uh, in the last weeks or so, we've seen individuals turn to Airbnb. <laughs> to donate money directly, right, uh, to uh, Ukrainian hosts. And the company actually waived its fees for hosts uh, and for people who make reservations. And they are, the, so the, the Ukrainian families that, that have apartments on Airbnb are actually, uh, uh, are actually uh, you know, getting the money. Uh, there have been lots of articles that have been written about this. I mean, I think we are seeing um, lots of donations uh, to, you know, animals, uh, you know, humane society types of things. Um, I do think that, um, you know, if I, if I think about uh, Christine's question, I do think that when we are on social media, we should um, you know, think about what we're sharing and uh, to be responsible in terms of what we pass along and, and to do fact checking and to make sure that we're not uh, sharing misinformation. And I, I think that that is right now uh, the most important thing that we can do from my perspective. But Pam, you probably... <laughs> Uh, have something better to offer. Well, I didn't know about better. Actually, I'm going to echo what you just said. I mean, one of the things that is always a problem with social media is that there is no control on the quality of the information. So you know, you're absolutely right, Regina, that there's a great outpouring. During the, um, the Haitian earthquake, the Red Cross raised $5 million in less than 24 hours. So it's a way of bringing people together and giving them some way of taking action. At the same time, it really underscores, especially this use of TikTok and how the younger, younger generation is so engaged in getting information from there, the importance of media literacy. And I realize that's not gonna fix anything this week or in this war, but we are not teaching critical thinking related to media. We are not teaching those kinds of skills that are essential for being a digital citizen for being responsible in terms of how we create and share information. So I would be saying that this is an opportunity to see what's in the media and say, we need to train people. 
We need to, I mean, reading, writing, and media literacy, because that is our world, and that will determine both the success of our, you know, global society, our local society, and, and our children. So, you know, it's a little bit of a soapbox for me, as those of you who know me know, but you, you can't have media without thinking about it, as Regina said. And so the only way is to say, what's the lesson that we can take from here of how to make this better? And uh, we have a question to Dr. Nice. Uh, and the question is, how can Putin hope to integrate the Ukrainians when they clearly passionately want to be European? Is it possible that the Russians also have a subculture wanting to be European? And that question's come from Crystal. Thank you. Um, first, I wanna thank uh, Dr. Rodlich. I mean, I teach media and politics too, and I, I, I know critical media education is important and people underestimate how much social media is actually making a change. I've been watching several um, YouTube videos from Russian bloggers recently. There is still complete access to the internet from Russia if you install, install a um, VPN. Um, everybody can get the information they want. I would also, well, to um, Christo's point, Putin can't hope that. What Putin is doing right now is solidifying Ukrainian statehood, whether he likes it or not. He is solidifying the na narrative that NATO hasn't been a threat except to those wanting to attack a NATO country. Um, with regards to Ukraine, there was, wasn't a solution. We couldn't have admitted Ukraine early. It would have led to war directly, immediately in 2008 had that happened. I, um, I, I think that wouldn't have been possible. There are, there are quite some disturbing images and voices we hear from Russia about support for Putin. I would just caution to take any of this literally. I grew up under the Soviet system. You cannot believe a single thing from any kind of survey in Russia. Just today I read um, that 700 university professors in Russia signed a letter supporting the war against Ukraine. But this is a dictatorship system right now. Um, I've seen, I've had Ukrainian students, I've had Russian students, I've watched enough um, content about modern Russia. Um, Russia is just as Western as most other Western countries. What Putin is doing here, he's doing probably because he believes this is the only moment in time where he can still do this. This is happening at, you could say, the moment where he already sees that contemporary Russians are in a completely different frame of mind than he is. But there have been a lot of stereotypes about Russia and Russians in the past. I've, I've asked students last year, before the war even happened, about who they think belongs to the West. And there have been plenty of stereotypes against almost all Eastern Europeans, especially Russians. I think Russian society, especially younger people who, and so that means everybody below 60 probably, has not that kind of attachment to the Soviet Union that people believed. People support Putin because they remember Yeltsin. If you've seen Anna, if you've seen videos of President Yeltsin in a drunk state of mind as an absolute embarrassment, Putin makes sense as an option. And so this is why people supported him. I think he is very careful in not trying to draw attention to what is happening in Ukraine. But I want to echo also what Leslie Ann said. We cannot let this be a moment where we think all Russians are evil and, uh, and that, that can never happen. Um, I, I think on Bill Maher, um, I don't know what, who that was, in someone said that um, this was policy also to Nazi Germany. The assumption was, yes, some, some Germans supported Hitler, but most Germans were under the complete thrall and terror of the Nazi regime. That's how we have to assume this to be. Um, and we have to be prepared after the fall of Putin, how to embrace Russia, how to embrace Russians, to make sure that while we don't want a complete economic globalization, that we still have a globalization of mind and spirit and a diverse global community. Thank you. 
And I think most Russians, most younger Russians are in favor of that from what I've seen. I'm not supposed to chime in, but Philip, do you believe there will be a fall of Putin? Well, till November 9th, 1989, I wouldn't have thought the East German government fell and it did. It will happen in, in one moment and it, it will be as if it will probably come as a surprise and then everybody said, well, that said, will say that made sense. The economic sanctions are absolutely horrifying. The sanctions on products and the loss of firms and you have even young people, I, I've watched videos of young people complaining, you know, I've been waiting for two years for the new Batman movie to come and now I can't watch Batman. People are going to ask the question, why is this happening to us? They may blame the West, but no government con can, can survive such a crisis. No government can survive the sacrificing of so many young men in war as Putin is doing right now. This is not survivable. I, I don't know how long it will take, but the tougher the sanctions are now, the quicker it can be over. Thank you. We have a is, sorry, sorry, Alison, may I add something is American Russians who have a lot of friends and parents living in Russia right now and seeing the crisis, just a couple of words in with regards to Philip just said. Thank you, uh, Philip, for your point about Russians, young people, and those who haven't seen the Soviet Union. I've seen the Soviet Union. And uh, I know what does it mean to live under such a repressions right there. I'm not pointing right now the Russians point of view. No, I don't think it's time to speak about what Russians feel right now because it's not comparable with what Ukrainians feel right now. It's, it's not the best time to speak about it. Um, I, I won't do that, but just you know, adding to what you just said, I think that um, I cannot talk to my mother right now. I can talk to her like this because it's like the propaganda is spreading from the phone right into my ears. And this is not only me feel right now, it's, it's about all young Russians who cannot speak to their parents. They do not have alternative resources of the information except the governmental TV. And uh, this is what they, they all are listening to. And uh, this is the huge separation among the Russian so society right now. It's, I don't know, I haven't seen it ever. I'm 43 and again, I haven't seen it neither in perestroika period, uh, Gorbachev and then Yeltsin or Chechen wars, uh, two wars or three wars. So never. And it's a huge tragedy again. So not, not speaking again, of course, of Russians, but just adding to your comment, Philip, that probably we all like me in particular, we know what does it mean right now um, to be German after the second world war. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your, your heartfelt thoughts and comments and perceptions, Elena. That was very important. Um, Elena Nicholson, do we have other questions as well? Yes, we do. And uh, I apologize if I butchered the name. Goduli Bhattacharya has a question. Is there a way to contextualize the current conflict within the parameters of proxy wars? For example, mirroring destabilization by the United States of democratically elected socialist governments in Africa, Latin America, and Southeast Asia in the Cold War era. Or, this, or is this a new form of empires in conflict? Uh, let, me, let me take a quick try at that. This will cycle back to Greg Williams' question about world systems theory. Uh, it's a uh, founder, Emmanuel Wallerstein, argued that um, there are two types of world systems, empires and then sort of global economic systems. Um, the U.S. is guilty, as this question implies, of many wars claiming millions of lives in Vietnam and elsewhere uh, to further U.S. economic interests and ostensibly national security in Latin America, although I think those wars were primarily economic wars. But they were, weren't wars of empire. The U.S., well, at least not in the 20th century, the 19th century, 
where I live, Santa Barbara, the whole Southwest was taken from Mexico. So the US empire, if you will, expanded in the 19th century. Uh, what's happening now seems to me um, to be an old fashioned extension of empire, um, extending one's boundaries. And um, empires, according to world systems theories are inherently unstable because of the cost of maintaining empire, which is something that Dr. Kines uh, mentioned also. Um, this is gonna be very costly to Russia. Um, and I also just wanna celebrate what Elena said. Um, we don't, well, we don't wanna demonize Russians for this right now um, at this point. This is not the point I think to do that. I certainly don't know enough about which Russians have access to VPNs, certainly older Russians do not, I assume. Um, I don't have access to a VPN and I'm an older American, so, um, and I don't do TikTok. So um, I look forward to your class, Pamela. Thank you, Rich. Um, Elena, do we have another question? I, I wanted have... to see if Dr. Radlich wanted to follow up on what Professor Applebaum said. Oh, yes. No, no, that's, I mean, that that's fine. I, I, I wasn't following up. I was just nodding in agreement. Okay, great. Uh, yes, we do have a question from Joe Co Coker. Uh, what strategies do you suggest for teaching critical thinking related to social media at various levels of the education system? For those outside formal education, can community-based awareness help? Uh, well, since since I hauled my soapbox out, I'll haul it out again briefly before other people get a chance to stand on theirs. Um, yes, I think you know any kind of any kind of uh, training helps. I think the really critical thing is that there much of the media literacy training that we're seeing right now does not meet the kids where they are. Right. Kids do not bifurcate their social experience. They do not have online and offline. They have one continuous world. So these programs that come in and say, just don't use social media are doomed to failure because these kids aren't going to give it up. And when you do that, you drive behaviors underground and you can't engage with them. So a program needs to also be continuous. It can't be just one lecture where you come in and you, you know, talk to them for an hour about, you know, how to be safe and how to be private and how to, you know, not, not sexed and how to all do these things because it's a, they need to experience these things and think through them. The best exercises I know are ones where you say to a kid, did you ever read the privacy instructions on, you know, it, on Snap? Did you know they own your stuff? or where you give them real life examples of what it means to be interconnected like they are on the internet. Um, I would recommend that everyone go look at uh, Fielding Graduates uh, site, cyberwise.org. Diana Graber uh, was one of our media master's students and has developed a, an entire curriculum for middle school kids that is eminently practical and very doable. And it really breaks down that kind of critical thinking into lessons that kids can connect with and start to activate their sort of moral um, understanding of these issues. Thank you, Dr. Rutledge. I have a particular question that I wanted to uh, just uh, put towards uh, Dr. Petard around diversity. Uh, I was curious, Dr. Petard, if you could speak a little bit more about uh, the rise of this sort of extremism that we're seeing, uh, it's, it's almost as if it's all over the world. We talk about the United States, but there's also um, this level of extremism in Europe. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit to that. What do you see happening? Uh, and what do you think we can do about that? That's a, a full question, Dr. Allison, and I would also welcome um, the thoughts and comments of our panelists as well. Um, extremism, sort of as mentioned before, is an interesting concept in that I would say in America we see sort of a proliferation of it in a way that we might have thought we had sort of overcome, um, but definitely in the last, especially election cycle, it was definitely on full display. Um, at, a, at a global scale, 
it is an opportunity in many ways for us to learn from and even just trying to tie into the last um, question around critical thinking and using up other examples is really, a, I think, a really provocative space, especially for those who might be in sort of their sort of different spaces of education, but having a chance to think critically about some of these broader connections and um, themes and trends that we didn't necessarily start, but in many ways have adopted um, and have potentially um, helped proliferate and expand. Um, I'm also thinking too about this notion of how this sort of boogeyman and critical race theory tamps down our ability to really highlight and talk about um, much of what we're seeing, whether it's an extremism, nationalism, any other ism, um, but really to this bigger point of the an authoritarian state, that's much of what we're doing and taking away our ability to really understand and see um, and, and discuss at a, a critical sort of in a critical analysis what's happening and how very much and how how quickly that very much is happening here too. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pittard. I really appreciate that. I'm thinking of, and, and I'll wait, there might be some people that want to drop in one more question. And while they're thinking of their question, I, I'm reminded of the book, War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning by Chris Hedges. And there's an amazing quote that I think sort of ties in with Dr. Pittard said, and probably larger, larger pieces of this conversation. And the quote goes like this. It says, the ethnic conflicts and insurgencies of our time, whether between Serbs and Muslims or Hutus and Tutsis are not religious wars. They are not clashes between cultures or civilizations, nor are they the result of ancient ethnic hatreds. They are manufactured wars born out of the collapse of civil societies perpetuated by fear, greed and paranoia and they are run by gangsters who rise up from the bottom of their own societies and terrorize all, including those they purport to protect. I think that gives us pause to reflect on our current situation and maybe even our historical situations. But I'd like to open it up. I see Dr. Tuma and Dr. Kanais both have comments. I'll start with Dr. Tuma. You know, it's very interesting that you uh, bring up this quote. As I was preparing for today, I was thinking there's so much that we can talk about. And one of the things that I'm fixated on, although clearly uh, we're seeing all of this unfold in Ukraine, um, you know, but I see, for example, the generals on CNN and other news media outlets. And I said, well, there could be another take unrelated to uh, how, uh, you know, what, what, how you feel about Ukraine, but we could see and do a media study and how it is, Allison, that you normalize war. And that is that you are taking, you know, I see these generals in their suit, not, I have nothing against them. I'm just observing, right? I said, if there were a textbook on how to normalize war, it would be what we are seeing in the media now. So you get the generals on and they say, here's what's going and here's what they're doing that, you know, they're talking military strategy, but it normalizes all of it in ways that while it might be, we might say it's appropriate now to understand what's going on in Ukraine, but it could, the form could be used later on, perhaps in sort of conflicts that we do not want normalized. Rich Applebaum, you're, you're on mute. I think there was someone before me um, who had their hand up also, you mentioned. Uh, go ahead, I, I think. Okay. I just wanted to sort of cycle back to the rise of authoritarian leaders, which is a global phenomenon. Um, and I don't need to tick off the, the many I just want to address the appeal of authoritarianism. Uh, when things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Uh, we look to, people look to strong leadership or at least the appearance of strong leadership. And a world systems theory argues that between periods of hegemonic dominance, which more or less, not equally, but kind of run the world economy, there's a period of chaos. 
And right now we're in the midst of a tectonic shift um, with the rise of China and you know the end of the American century pretty clearly and how that plays out uh, is unclear. Um, but in moments like this, there's a huge appeal uh, of despots, which I think we need to better understand and deal with. And that just raises one comment on social media. Uh, the master of the political master of social media is Donald Trump. Um, he used it extremely effectively to mobilize his followers, 40% um, of Americans who for one reason or another. So, um, so like all technologies, it cuts both ways, I think, one of the challenges we face. Thank you, Dr. Applebaum. And uh, Philip, one last comment, and then we will close this session. I think what we are seeing with the, right, with the attractiveness of authoritarianism is also, I, I deliberately wanted to distinguish between what Americans understand as socialism and what in political theory it is. The Soviet Union did not follow any ideas about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, there was not a real awareness of, of the necessity to really celebrate diversity. It was also always a fake diversity. There was officially no, um, no LGBTQ identity. There was also officially no alcoholism. And so what we are seeing is the effects of, of a very strong nationalist um, totalitarian narrative and how it lingers on. Putin has also been very good to, to find every weakness in the West and to, dis uh, to disrupt our sense of democracy. I think a solution here is to teach civics, to teach um, everybody in Western countries that democracy means that we are all playing a part in it, that you can't have democracy without diversity. And that what we see happening right now um, is something that we need to see as a teachable moment. We need to, we need to, honor the lives that are being lost right now by saying, no, we cannot give up on diversity. We cannot give up on democracy. And we need to not give authoritarianism that wide of an opening to disrupt ourselves. All of what we've seen in the last decades has been a deliberate result or result of deliberate disinformation campaigns also originating from Russia and from the Russian government. And so we need to just be be stronger in believing in our own uh, democratic values. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Knais. And, and I want to thank every single one of our panelists. We have just two minutes left. This was a very, very um, insightful discussion and really appreciate the audience questions. You make the discussion very rich with your questions because you allow all of us to sit and reflect on what's being shared. Um, so again, many thanks. We sincerely hope that this DEI critical conversation has both provided you with new perspectives and a new resolve to seek peace building in these troubled times. As we close out this session, um, we have placed in the chat a resource list of agencies that would welcome your individual contributions on behalf of the Ukraine. I think Elena has those. I would also like all of us to be mindful of our Russian allies, friends, and colleagues who are also suffering. There has been an unfortunate uptick in anti-Russian violence in our country against some in our Russian American community. We cannot espouse social justice for one group without realizing that there are individuals in Russia today speaking out against the war and Russian Americans here in the US who are also deeply concerned and committed to peace. Fielding Graduate University is founded on social justice, which is rooted in a belief and love for all humanity. As an institution, we are united in the worldwide call for immediate peace and hope for a swift end to this unnecessary violence. As an institution, I want you to know we have no business ties in Russia, but we are definitely tied in spirit to the long arc of justice. Please take time to consider how you might support refugees uh, from this war and how we all might support one another as the beloved community. Thank you all. 
and take good care. Thank you, Allison. Thank you.